What's going on guys? Nick Lessigore here, Exit 12 Brewery, in the basement, on a brew day. I am, as you can see, Brandonless. Uh, today is his daughter's birthday. Because of the coronavirus, uh, they're keeping it very, very small. So, he's doing the birthday party. I'm here brewing a beer. Why am I brewing a beer? Well, aside from the fact that, you know, it's been a while. Uh, <laughs> Quick update on the homebrew competition that we entered our Sam Hazy IPA. We finished second for the second year in a row, which is great. Obviously you wanna win the whole thing, so that's the end goal. But uh, basically, since then we really haven't brewed. And so it's been a while. And uh, what better way, what better reason to brew than to do it uh, during all this madness? You know, first and foremost, I hope everybody is staying safe. I hope you're all taking the correct precautions. Working in the medical field as I do, uh, I'm seeing some of this stuff firsthand and uh, it's no joke. So I hope everybody's staying safe. I hope everybody's families are safe. First and foremost, always look out for, for yourself and your family, um, for sure. And then relating to the job, I mentioned I was in the medical field, but that is uh, go going to be no longer pretty soon. <laughs> I accepted a position in what I consider my dream job, uh, and I'm, I'm really excited. I never thought, you know, uh, 33 years old now, I never thought when I first started working or even when I was going to school that this opportunity would come up. And so I'm, I'm extremely fortunate and excited to get going. I can give more information when the time is right and I feel more comfortable. Uh, maybe I'll, maybe I'll allocate a little bit more of a home, homebrew tasting or something base video before I get in uh, the real specifics of the job, but just know um, there are some good things going on around the Exit 12 Brewery, around the Lessigore household in general, and uh, we're staying safe. And, and you know, I think there's a lot. Uh, my wife just got a new job about a month ago, so the two of us are transitioning into two new jobs. <laughs> she stayed within her career. I'm I'm kind of going outside of the healthcare field, which I'm very very happy and, and excited to get started with. But let's get to the brew day. It's seven in the morning. Here in New England, I've got my coffee. Check this bad boy out. Brew record, post, repeat. <laughs> got this on a mug. Brandon is a genius marketing whiz when it comes to thinking of things that we can put on shirts and mugs and things like that. He's got a brain for it. Uh, but today we are brewing the COVID Pale Ale. Pretty simple, uh, not as creative as some of our other beer names, but uh, this beer was supposed to be the Blueberry Hefeweizen. Unfortunately, your boy got lazy. I didn't order the ingredients. All this stuff is happening with the coronavirus. And so uh, I just knew that we needed a brew day. The Sam IPA is about to kick. Uh, we, on my keg, Brandon's has already kicked on his, uh, back at his house. So he's got no eggs of 12 beer left. I'm about to have no eggs of 12 beer left and uh, we need to get a nice beer on tap. And so um, this is pretty much what it is. We're probably not gonna enter this into any competitions, I don't think. Uh, if one comes up that we're interested in, maybe. But this is a new beer that we're brewing. Uh, it's a brand new recipe. Basically a pantry pale ale of sorts. Um, what I basically did was took some grains that we had, uh, base grains with some specialty grains, and then we have a ton of hops so we could, we could pick. It's gonna be New England style. So it's gonna be hazy. And we're actually trying a different water this time. Usually we utilize distilled water, but because the um, grocery store that we get our food delivered didn't have any distilled water left, we're gonna do spring water, which means that we kind of had to transform our water profile a little bit. And Brandon and I did some research and we figured out what could be the best way to utilize some of our salts, gypsum and calcium chloride. So, because I can't see where I have the laptop, the, I'll have to bring it up to my eyes. All right, get some nice coffee. Um, it's like 45, 50 degrees down in the basement. I don't have a way to heat the basement yet, so needless to say, um, coffee's getting cold quick. All right, here we go. So we're starting out, we're rolling out a little bit over two pounds of uh, Golden Promise, a little over two pounds of Great Western two row, uh, as well as one pound, uh, almost two pounds, so one and three quarter pound of flaked oats, a pound of the blonde roasted oat malt from Brees. Now, for those of you that went to Homebrew Con, you know this malt because Brees was giving out a pound of it. Uh, 
It's a brand new malt that they have. They said it's very popular. I actually gave them a call yesterday to get some more information on uh, their, their grain, uh, you know, for diastatic power and uh, yield and protein percentage and things like that. And so I was talking to one of the representatives from Brees and he said it's a really popular malt and uh, they think hopefully they'll have more information on the malt itself as it becomes more popular. Uh, so we're throwing a pound of that in, as I mentioned, because I, I read that on New England IPAs, it's good, but the representative at Brees told me don't use any more than 10%, so that's what we're doing, 10%, one pound. Uh, we're also going with a pound of our local Vienna from Valley Malt in Hadley, Massachusetts. Got to start getting rid of some of that Valley uh, malt that we have from a, from a grain share brand and I did about a year ago. Uh, white wheat malt, we're coming in with a pound of that. And then 14.7 uh, ounces of Maris Otter, which was all we had left as well from the other base grains too. And four ounces of honey malt, which we found in our New England IPs. The honey malt really gives it the grain bill of complexity, a really nice sweetness. So we're really excited. That was the last of the honey malt. And then the base grains that I mentioned, we're all out of base grain. So we're gonna have to order something here soon if we're gonna be brewing. Uh, my only concern with the coronavirus is the state of Massachusetts being a shelter in place, and then we don't have anything to brew with. Um, we don't have any base grains or anything. So I'm gonna have to order some of those things soon. All right, so for the hops, we're doing a 60 minute edition of Columbus. Uh, basically, we did that with Sam. The hops in terms of um, the times and the amounts are gonna be pretty close to the Sam New England IPA we did, but they're a little bit different. So we did Galaxy and Columbus for Sam, which I'm keeping, but instead of Citra, which we did in Sam, I'm actually gonna substitute it with Mosaic and kind of, I messed around a little bit with the, with the amounts. So as I mentioned, a half ounce of Columbus at 60 minutes, and then we're not doing any more hop additions during the boil. So we found that the Columbus gives us a really nice smooth bitterness, which I'm really excited about. Uh, and then we're gonna come in with a 15 minute Whirlpool at 185 degrees. We're gonna do two ounces of Galaxy and one and a half ounces of Mosaic. Really wanna get some of those berry, blueberry, tropical fruit, <coughs> excuse me, tropical fruit flavors. And then uh, dry hop, very simple. I think I'm only gonna do 24 hour dry hop. I'm finding anything more than maybe two days of a dry hop, uh, we're getting these really weird um, vegetal flavors. And I think you can really only get, after a day and a half, maybe two days, we're finding that we're, you're not getting much more out of the dry hop. So we're gonna have a pretty big dry hop charge here. Uh, three ounces of the mosaic, as well as um, one and a quarter ounces of the galaxy. So uh, we're really excited that that leaves us at eight and a half ounces of hops total. For Sam, we did like uh, over 10, and this will bring us at 53, just about 54 IBUs, and Sam was, uh, I think, 65 or 66. So with the lower uh, ABV going from 6.2 to 5.1%, at least that's what the calculator says, we're kind of dialing down the hops as well because we want them to play well with, this, with the sweetness of the grain bill. And we don't want it to be overly bitter or, um, you know, a little too uh, vegetal or anything like that. So we're, I'm really excited about this beer. Uh, it'll be interesting to see how these base malts play with each other. And uh, that's about it. So let's uh, mill some grain and mash in. All right, looks like it's time to start uh, milling the grains. So let's do it. So the crush is looking pretty good, I'd say. It's a little, uh, a little dusty, but we have found that this crush is probably our sweet spot. Uh, you can see some of the husks are still intact. Um, but one thing I like to do, Brandon and I like to do, is when we are brewing with um, oats or anything that can't be milled, Instead of putting it in separately, which I've seen a lot of homebrewers do, we started doing that. We found we either got maybe a stuck 
sparge because they were sitting on the bottom or maybe it wasn't filtering right because they were sitting on the top. So what we like to do is uh, instead of like maybe adding it separately in the middle of the mash or beginning or end, what we like to do is just kind of mix them in after the mill, uh, the grain's already been milled. And what we find is it allows more even disbursement of the strike water. And not only does it prevent a stuck, not only does it prevent a stuck sparge, but it also really just evens things out in terms of the mash and allows for less uh, channeling when uh, sparging and things like that. So we find when we do it this way, uh, it gives us really great results. All right, I've moved the Robo Brew unit back a little bit so we're not so much under the hood vent because really we don't need it until we boil. So it's good to have some extra space um, in terms of, you know, so I'm not hitting my head or coming close to hitting my head or whatever the case may be, maybe being a little bit too close to the concrete slab here. So uh, we're at 158. I'm going to push that down to 152 after I'm done mashing in all the grain and uh, let's get going. You know, we're finding that with our hood vent, we get a lot of condensation that drips. And so we're constantly finding ourselves on drip management. If anybody has any ideas for how to manage that, uh, we're all ears. All right, as you can tell, probably the mash looking a little viscous a little thin we mashed in at what we usually do for our beers which is 1.7 uh, quarts per pound sorry as I adjust the camera a little bit uh, we probably could have brought that down a little bit but um, I'm finding with that's kind of our sweet spot with most of our beers uh, we, we probably turn it down a little bit more for, for like stouts and porters and things but this is just going to be an easy drink in pale ale, just something I was trying to clear out inventory a little bit. And uh, as I mentioned, I didn't get around to ordering ingredients for our blueberry Hefeweizen. So this will just fill up five gallons on the keg for Brandon and I, two and a half gallons each. And, uh, you know, it's good for us right now. All right, so we've hit 60 minutes on the mash. I'm going to turn the pump off. And just by looking at it, I don't know if you guys can see it yet, but it looks dark. <laughs> I'm gonna move this over. Okay. Pop this top off. Oh yeah. First running's looking very dark, but also I don't know if you can see it on the camera, but very clear. So I don't utilize the top screen on the Robo Brew. Uh, I found that it causes more headaches than anything else, and I also don't utilize the very fine mesh screen that's on the bottom as well. I only have um, the, the uh, screen that's, there's two screens for the bottom of the RoboBrew, and then there's a false bottom. I only utilize one of those screens and then the false bottom, the more broad, open screen. But we are looking good here. Shooting for 152. It was at 150. Range from 149 to 152 throughout the mash. So let's pull this malt pipe up and let's get sparging. That's my fault. I actually forgot about the ramp up. <laughs> so we're going to mash out uh, for 10 minutes at 170 uh, to prepare for the ramp up so we can pop up the malt pipe and then sparge. So now we got to work to get to 170. Let's do it. All right, we've hit the 10 minute mash out point at 170, which we just started doing even though I've been home brewing for, you know, five years. Uh, we found that between that and the grain crush that we get, that we just changed the grain mill uh, settings 
the past three, four beers we've done, we've gotten awesome efficiency. So we're gonna pop this off. Put it off to the side, the pump. Ooh, that's hot. We have had issues in the past, as I talk away from the microphone, with uh, our malt pipe is bent somehow. I can't, I don't know how it happened when we were cleaning it or whatever. So in the past, this malt pipe has been quite challenge to get out. funneling beautifully. No rice hulls. We haven't used any rice hulls, even with all the flaked adjuncts we've had the past three or four beers because we kept getting stuck sparges and we think it may have been because of the rice hulls. You would think that they're supposed to help filtering. And unfortunately, this is what we have left for rice hulls. That big sack and a full tote. So if we continue brewing and having success without rice hulls, I will be trying to get rid of those rice hulls. <laughs> Another fun tip that I thought I would mention for those of you that enjoy keeping inventory of things and are as meticulous as I am, uh, you know, what I'm finding is with a lot of these salts that we use for our water chemistry, they come in these bags that aren't very, uh, not only they're plastic, they're not very, you know, great for the environment, but at the same time, not only that, but it's very hard to, as you can see, to stack these things. So what we're doing is we're trying to find ways to organize our salts without buying things to do that. Things are as expensive as they are, so we're trying to avoid that. So what I did was, I only had a little bit left of this PBW uh, and that I put in one of these two that we have left. So those both are full. I uh, cleaned this inside with, oddly enough, water with PBW. And then I threw some water in here and then uh, some food grade sanitizer. And so this is properly cleaned, but this actually now has gypsum in it. and. What I'm hoping to do is, um, as we use our salts, and as we use things that can house those salts, in time I'm hoping to uh, continue to fill up these really economical and really realistic, you know, stackable things with our salts so that we don't have, you know, this nonsense. <laughs> uh, just another way to think about going about in terms of inventory and keeping things manageable and organized. As you can see, the filtering is looking pretty good. The grain bed is nice and even. And what's great about not utilizing rice hulls is I like to cook with the grain sometimes. So I'll be taking quite a bit of this grain uh, and I'll make pizza dough or I'll make bread, especially now with the coronavirus. It, things like this will really come in handy, uh, being able to repurpose and, and reuse things like, like spent grain. All right, we're at about 180 degrees now. I am going to uh, move this unit. Uh, I have it on wheels here. I'm gonna attempt to move it closer. To the top here. And then we're gonna push this back. And we are pretty much right underneath the vent where we need to be. I'm gonna, there's an option here where I can take the wheels and this thing is so heavy, I don't think that I even need to turn the wheels off, so to speak. But the cool thing is, is that I have a 
this thing uh, comes up and down with foot power. I wish I could remember what the termino terminology was. So we're just going to move this up. This table we got off like a uh, business restaurant supply website. It's pretty expensive, but uh, it's really been nice for us to be able to move it around. And then during the summer, if we want, uh, we can take this, move it over closer to the window, uh, or the door rather, I have, I have a walkout basement. Uh, and what we can do is, if we buy a jaded wart chiller that's good for electric systems, we can chill right outside the door. So during the summer, which would be nice because it would be significantly faster. Down a little bit. I'm gonna turn the fan on, it's gonna be pretty loud, but we're gonna take a pre-boil gravity. We hit our volume on point, 7.41 gallons, pretty much on the dot. As I mentioned, I'm gonna turn the vent on. I like to take a pre-boil reading once this starts boiling. The minute I see the boil action, I take a gravity because I, that's how I know everything's adequately mixed up. So uh, let's continue on to the next stage. All right, here is the spent grain. And I probably won't use all of this. I mean, this is quite a bit. Uh, but what's great again about this, and I, and I didn't really touch on it when I was talking about it, but what's great about this is uh, there's no rice hulls, and the rice hulls tend to uh, get caught in your teeth, and, they're, and they don't taste like anything. If anything, uh, I did a pizza. If anything, they're, they're, they're a nuisance. Um, so when you don't utilize rice hulls, um, you have some awesome spent grain to do like pizza crust and stuff and bread like I mentioned. So I'll probably do a pizza crust and uh, I'll probably do a bread as well. So pretty awesome. Also, just a quick tip. Uh, you want to keep this in your fridge no more than a week. Uh, if you want to freeze it and use it more later, you can. As far as I know, you can freeze and refreeze or free, unfreeze and refreeze. Uh, so I'll keep this in my fridge because I'll probably use some tomorrow, but then I'll throw it in my freezer and thaw it out as I see fit, or I'll take one cup measurements in bags and I'll throw those in the freezer so that I have something easy I can just pull out and use. So, spent grain, kaboom. Alright, we have hit the boil and we are adding a half ounce at 60 minutes of Columbus. Alright, here we go with a tablespoon of yeast nutrient. We really enjoy and believe in yeast nutrient and the effects that it can have on a beer. We want those yeasts to be healthy. And then the next addition is gonna be some, just a little teaspoon, a little bit of Irish moss. All right, so we added the Irish moss at flame out instead of five minutes before flame out because my timer on uh, beer smith uh, was on the fritz apparently. But uh, we cooled down. We cool down to about 180. I'm gonna bump that, ramp it up to uh, 185. And then we're gonna whirlpool for 15 minutes with Galaxy and Mosaic. Uh, but I just wanted to show you this quick thing. This is a whirlpool arm for electric systems. It is from Brewers Hardware. We may have shown you this before, but I just think this is the coolest little piece of equipment. Uh, you just pop it in the top where the pump arm goes, uh, the research arm would go, and uh, it'll 
recirculate in a circle uh, for you so that you can dry hop, or rather you can whirlpool uh, effectively. So we're gonna use this. And I just wanted to show you guys that real quick. So why don't we uh, start the whirlpool process? So the whirlpool arm has been chilling in food grade sanitizer. So what we're gonna do is just pop this in. It's a little bit of a tight fit. You can see if you can get it as tight as you can. And then you turn the pump on. As you can see, no leaking. And this will start to recirculate. As you can see it over here, it is moving. At 185, so it's time to add in the hops. Oh, start the 15 minute whirlpool. All right, we're at 69 degrees. I figure ambient temperature is like 50 in here, so we'll lose some temperature when we're transferring. But now it's time to transfer. Turn the pump off. Pull this through. Dip that in. You've seen our um, and we're on our way. You've seen the way that we cool the beer down, so I wasn't gonna show that again, maybe in another video. But uh, what we're gonna do now is transfer this and uh, pitch the yeast. I got an interesting thing I'm doing with the yeast that I can show you as well. What I'm doing now is taking 16 ounces of wort. A little bit more, but 16 ounces of wort, and what I'm gonna do is in the starter, instead of pitching the entire starter, I'm gonna pour out uh, the proper starter, leaving just the yeast cake, and then I'm gonna pitch this uh, wort that we have on the, on the yeast cake, and then I'm gonna swirl it around, leave it for a few hours, and then I'll pitch the yeast. The idea being I don't wanna dilute the beer with wort that uh, I didn't brew, so uh, it's better off. What I could just do is I could just take the proper starter and I could pour it out and just pitch the yeast, but I'd rather do this. It's an experiment for us and it'll be interesting to see uh, if it does anything to the beer. All right, we're still transferring into the fermenter. I took a sample here, looks pretty awesome. Nice and murky, great looking color, a little bit darker than, uh, slightly darker than I thought, but it's looking good. So I can't wait to get a uh, gravity on this thing. All right, we uh, yielded five and a quarter gallons. Uh, it's gonna increase with the starter that I'm putting in, but again, it's my own wort, so that'll be nice. Um, maybe a little bit more than five and five and a quarter. Uh, what I'm gonna do now is clean up. We're gonna do our yeast thing and I'll come back with some numbers and I'll pitch the yeast. Also real quick, it's probably not the most accurate way, but we have a probe here that will alert our, um, our temperature gauge to turn on. Uh, turn the heat on when it's when it's too cold and turn the, the refrigerator on when it's too hot. So a pro tip that I've found is using painter's tape is it'll easily come off. As you can see on the side here we utilized masking tape um, and, and it was just it didn't come off so we started utilizing painter's tape. So just something to keep in mind, something minor if you want to keep the condition of your firmzilla looking good or any plastic fermenter really. All right, so I've had the starter. It's been going for about three hours. All I did was, as you can see, the original starter I had had the yeast and proper starter. 
I decanted the proper starter. I put in 16 ounces of the wort of this beer, from this beer, and I let it uh, swirl around for about three hours. It was only supposed to be two, but I fell asleep, took a nap. Uh, it was a long brew day. <laughs> now we have the Tilt wireless hydrometer. I'm just gonna spray some star sand. And then we're gonna drop this puppy in. All set. Here's our starter. Pop it off. Also, I don't think I mentioned what yeast we're using throughout the whole video. <laughs> we are using WLP 066 uh, London Fog, which uh, oddly enough is not on the Beersmith. Uh, so I had to just put in East Coast Ale, which is pretty much the same thing. I think it's WLP 008. But this is London Fog, which is a New England IPA yeast. So we're going to pitch. And we can call this good. Putting the top on. And now, in place of, we're not gonna do, we're not gonna pressurize this because in our competition uh, that we put Sam in, the uh, New England IPA that we did, uh, we were talking to the head brewer and we wanted to try something different. So I'm going to open up the spunding valve all the way. And what we're going to do is just going to put it on the top. We're going to let it ferment for 48 hours and then we're going to put it on pressure and we're probably going to dry hop at that point. We might wait until the end. We're not sure yet, but after 48 hours, we will be putting this beer on pressure. So that is that. The COVID pale ale, what we're calling it now, for now, is ready to ferment. All right, so we are a little under a week into fermentation. And as you can see, we're at 10 PSI. We ended up turning on the gas about two days into fermentation. And then we dry hopped. Well, first we dry hopped and then we turned the gas on. But the idea is we spoke to a brewer at a local brewery, and that's the way he does his New England IPAs. So now we're going to take a gravity reading. As you can see, it's, it looks like it's slowing down a little bit. But we'll take a gravity reading and then taste the sample and see where we're at. So here is the first pull we took off. As you can see, very foamy. <laughs> It is carbonated uh, because it has been under pressure. It's just not carbonated to serving pressure. Uh, so we're going to let the foam die down, uh, continue to pull samples until we get up to the point where uh, we can take an accurate sample. I don't know if you can see that or not. Looks like we're sitting at 0 to 1 maybe. 0 to 0. I mean, you can see the 0 to 0, so it's probably more like 0 to 1. Um, we have some room to go. I'm going to continue to let this ferment. I'd like to get down somewhere in the 011 range. Um, probably not too much lower. We want this to be a pale ale. And we tend to uh, attenuate very high. So it's just going to be worth keeping a lookout the next few days. But uh, let's take a sip of this thing. Before we take a sip, I kind of wanted to give you guys an idea of color. Uh, putting it up to light, you can see it's very hazy, possibly pretty milky looking. Uh, I don't know if it shows on camera, but there are quite quite a few uh, hop flakes. There's, there's quite a bit of hot matter that's floating around in it. Um, I took the 
hydrometer out. It is soaking right now in some sanitizer. Uh, but it looks the part for sure. Absolutely looks the part, uh, as you can see. Very nice looking. I was a little concerned about the color, putting the recipe together because I wasn't sure, um, given the pantry-like style of which <laughs> Brandon and I put the ingredients in this recipe. We weren't sure in terms of how the color would look, but the SRM is pretty much on point from what Beersmith suggested. Um, and it looks very, very hazy. Um, there is, again, some hot matter, but my assumption is going to be that uh, with time, as well as cold crashing, we plan to cold crash for at least two days or so, uh, that with time, um, that those hot flakes will kind of fall to the bottom and we'll be able to get a, a much clearer product in terms of uh, floaties. But we do want it to be very hazy. Uh, we do want it to be very cloudy. And so that's it. So let's get a taste on it. All right, we are getting ready to taste this thing. As you can see, maybe get a little bit closer up. That is what the sample looks like. Right now, uh, we're probably sitting somewhere in the 4% range. 050, I think, was our OG. So, uh, not where we want it yet. It could even be lesser alcohol than that. Not where we want it yet, but we did do a few things different with this. Um, we did dry hop at High Croissant, and we let it sit for a little bit more than 48 hours. Uh, the night I was supposed to take the hops out of the Firmzilla, I fell asleep, and so I did it the next morning before I went to work. Uh, which is not used to the way we do New England IPAs here at Exit 12. What we usually do is we uh, dry hop at the end of fermentation and we find that letting it sit for a day or two, two at the most, we tend to get some really nice tropical fruit flavors from it. But here it is. Let's get a smell. So it does smell phenolic. What we find is when we dry hop at High Croissant, uh, like we did with this, we're finding that with our beers, they tend to be very overly bitter and may have like polyphenols uh, associated. Uh, but we think with the cold crashing on this specific beer, with our new fermentation chamber, we think with the cold crashing effect, the hot matter will fall down to the bottom and we're hoping that that helps with that flavor and it allows some of the tropical flavors of the galaxy that we dry hopped with to come out. Let's see what it tastes like. Cheers. It's very light. It's sweet, but it does have that kind of, um, that bitterness, that overly bitterness that lingers at the end and then kind of sits uh, on the palate. I think cold crashing is going to do this beer a lot of good. It's actually not that bad. It's not bad at all. I think a lot of the flavors that I'm getting are attributed to possible um, byproducts that are of the hot flakes that are sitting in it. Don't know if you can see that or not, but byproducts of the hot flakes that are sitting in it, as well as, um, you know, the fact that it's not done fermenting. So we're going to let this sit a little bit longer. Zero to zero is where we're at now, and we'll come and check on it. I don't know if I'll get it on camera, but we'll come and check on it uh, in a few days. All right, here we are finally for the tasting of the COVID hazy pantry pale ale. It is very well carved. I actually had to let this sit for a little bit because it was way too foamy. I may have to turn down the pressure on my lines. But that is what it looks like. Very hazy. Very nice looking. Um, this was, I, I threw this on CO2 at 21 PSI for about two or three days, probably closer to three, which is probably why it's so uh, carved up. As you can see the legs on it, um, pretty nice. Uh, and then I put it to serving pressure. So uh, I've already had a glass of this, but uh, for the video's sake, let's uh, give it a try. Definitely get some ripe mango, some pineapple, which is really nice. That's probably the galaxy. 
There is a tinge of the polyphenol kind of uh, flavor that I was talking about when I was taking samples of it. Maybe some slight citrus, but let's take a sip. Cheers. Yeah, it's nice. It's not bad at all. Uh, it ended up coming in at about 4.6%. So wanted to hit the 5%, didn't really get there. I, I may have, when I was siphoning off uh, the yeast starter, I may have dumped some yeast by accident. So I think there's, I'm gonna go about it a different way from now on. I don't think I'm going to utilize the, um, the, the starter in a can method. I think what I'm gonna do is take some uh, the way I did do it, which was uh, take some wort uh, from the finished product, you know, before it goes into the fermenter and utilize that and pitch the yeast in that and let it go um, and let it twirl around for on my starter in the flask for a little bit before I end up pitching it. Just because when you're pitching uh, yeast from a starter that you're not sure how it Necessarily, you can test the gravity in the flask, but how does it affect the f gravity of the OG of the beer that's in the fermenter? That's kind of um, a math equation in and of itself that I'm not willing to do. So uh, I think I'm gonna do that differently. Uh, I think that the beer could be sweeter, but again, we didn't have as much base malt as I wanted, which is why I had to mix two or three different base malts. But it's a good beer. It's fine. It's probably something that I'll sip on. Um, and then when I need an, an open keg, if I still have some, I'll probably just dump it out uh, because it was just a fun experiment more than anything else. And uh, with everything that's going on right now, it's kind of hard to get people to try the beer um, without spending money on shipping and things of that nature. So uh, if I if there is some left, I split the keg with Brandon. I gave it to Brandon, He's he's been sipping on it himself. So if there is any left, uh, we, we could can it or bottle it or, or I'll just dump it out back. But either way, it was a good experiment, something that I enjoyed and hopefully something you guys enjoyed watching. So cheers.